Good evening. My name is Malcolm Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral and welcome to the forum. Tonight we are choosing, every year we choose a theme and our theme for the cathedral this year is the year of bridges. It, it turned out to be a theme that's really important for us, especially as we're in coronavirus shelter in place, um, building bridges, connecting to people who are different from us, um, reaching out to others is especially important during these days. And for this whole year, we've talked a lot about how to form connections with people who are different from us. How can we reach out across the divides that separate us? While racism is very much on our minds right now, another serious divide between us is religion. Grace Cathedral hosts what we may think is the largest regularly meeting yoga, yoga and practice in the world. We have hundreds of people, six or 700 people gathering weekly when we're um, actually gathering. And there are estimates that over 20 million people in the United States practice yoga. But what do we really know about the religion that gave us this practice? What is Hinduism, one of the world's oldest major religions that is practiced over one, by over 1 billion people? Tonight, we're trying to get um, Wendy Doniger to join us. She's one of the foremost scholars on Hinduism. She has doctorates in Sanskrit and Indian studies from Harvard and Oxford. She's Professor Emerita of the University of Chicago and a prolific author, translator, and editor. She's published almost 30 books in as many years. Her groundbreaking work, The Hindus, an alternative history, elucidates the relationship between recorded history and imaginary worlds, the inner life, and the social history of Hindus. And I'm going to begin by reading a little bit from the back of the dust um, cover. Um, it gives a sense for what the book is about an engrossing and definitive narrative account of history and myth, the Hindus offers a new way of understanding one of the world's oldest major religions. Hinduism does not lend itself easily to a strictly chronological account. Many of its central texts cannot be reliably dated within a century. Its central tenets arrive at particular moments in Indian history and offer diff often differ according to gender or caste. And the differences between groups of Hindus far outnumber their commonalities. Yet the greatness of Hinduism lies precisely in many of these idiosyncratic qualities that continue to inspire debate today. This groundwork breaking work elucidates the relationship between recorded history and imaginary worlds, the inner life in the social history of Hindus. So this week we are talking about Wendy Doniger's book the Hindus in Alternative History. It's this book right here. And you know, one of the first questions I have for you is, I mean, you have made a lifelong study of South Asian religions and you know, you've studied social conflict and probably racism and xenophobia. And you know, with all the things that are happening across the country right now, I wonder how all that scholarly experience kind of informs your, your sense for what's happening right now? Well, there's a great deal in Hinduism about um, the end of the world. <laughs> that's one thing right, that came to mind right, immediately. That's true. <laughs> I, the first thing that anyone who's ever studied Hinduism would say right now is that it is the Kali Yuga. It is the end of time when all the worst aspects of human beings are magnified, their virtues vanish, the gods become really angry and everything's about to go up in smoke. Um, so that's, the Kali Yuga is characterized by the failure of human beings to be good people. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, so you, yeah, you're talking <laughs> about the end times. And I wonder, you know, um, Christians and um, Jews may be for, like more familiar with just the apocalyptic accounts that we've inherited. Yeah. And um, can you talk a little bit about you know how, how it's not an apocalypse in the sense that suddenly things go wrong and the gods interve intervene and, and wipe you out. The Greeks had that, the um, Jews and Christians had that. No, in India, it's an inevitable decay in the nature of things. When the, when the world begins in the golden age, the, there are four ages. In the golden age, people are good and kind. They live a very long time. And the, everybody's just fine. It's like, in a way, it's like the myth of Eden, really. Everything and they live a hundred years long, right? In oh, that they live hundreds age. and hundreds of years, indeed. Ah. Um, everything is wonderful. But unlike Eden, where there's a serpent in some versions and a 
and a satanic intervention in another that spoils the garden, things simply wind down through time. People can't go on being good. They get tired of being good. They start lying. They start stealing. They start committing adultery. They start killing people. And so the golden age goes into a third age and then a second age, that is to say the fourth, the, the age of the four is the good age. We decline to three to two, and when there's only one quarter of goodness left, that's now. Ah, right. And it just happens. It happens because people can't go on being good. They get tired of it. Sometimes they get bored, uh, sometimes, whatever it is. And there we are now, and there's nothing we can do about it. In some versions of the myth, it's like the myth of Noah's Ark. Some people survived, good people gathered together in a cave. And when it's all over, the the world goes up in fire, the world is up in flood, they come out of the cave and they find other people coming out of other caves. And I love this line. They say to each other, my dear, how good it is to see you still alive. Oh, well, that's so perfect with all of us in our own caves right now. We come out of the cave and you see you're not the only one that survived. And then we begin again. Those are good people. So they don't lie. So they don't kill. So they don't commit right. adultery. And, and then the, world, the cycle begins again. And they get tired of exactly. So, so it's so not that the gods intervene. It's that we ourselves can't hang on. We, we have it. We have it. And we just loosen our grip and we slide down in it, but it will start over again. That's the good news. Right, right exactly. I, I, I love that story. And you know, one of the things that was so powerful about your book for me was there were so many stories like it in there. And, and I, I want, oh, I know, I just, they're, they're so powerful. I, I you know, I, I think maybe I've been reworking through the, the creation narratives and Genesis and Noah, and maybe I've, I, I've overdone it on those and I need to start reading some other people's stories. But maybe well, you certainly need to about, read these stories. These are the best stories in the world. Oh, they're so great. They're so, <laughs> I, that's what I think I get from your book too, is how much you appreciate these stories. Oh, I love them. I keep finding new ones. I've been doing this for 50, 60 years. I keep finding stories. I didn't know that story. I didn't know that. I, there's lots and lots of it. It's, you know, it's yeah. been going on since about 2000 BCE. So right, that's a long right. time to tell. So it's an unbroken tradition. Yeah. Um, so maybe so. you can give us kind of like the introduction to, 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 the, to the South Asian religions, Hinduism. I love that you started with 50,000 years. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, you know, the first two chapters, I, I really, that helps me to situate everything to have, you know, yeah. that big of a perspective. But I'd love it if you could just give us kind of an introduction, a summary of, of, of just what constitutes this, this religious world. Well, since it's gone on for such a long time, it's gotten very complicated because one of the things that's characteristic of, of Hinduism and unlike uh, some other religions is that when somebody has a new idea that differs from the old idea, they don't throw out the old idea, they build onto it. In a way, it's like the New Testament be building on the Hebrew Bible. You don't say, well, now we have the New Testament, we're not gonna read Genesis. You say, no, 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 we still have the Proverbs and so forth. So it's rather like that in the sense that the Vedic books, which are these 1500 BCE books, are really very different from what comes, but they're still there. So you have the Vedas, you have animal sacrifice, you have all sorts of things. Yeah. Then you stop doing animal sacrifice and there's a lot of non-injury and the idea of not of, of animal life as well as human life being sacred, but some people still go on doing animal sacrifices. Right, right. So then you have the people, you have this new stage where you have non-injury and then you have new gods coming up, some of whom are very fierce and who demand other kinds of sacrifice. And uh, So it's, it's layered and layered and rich and rich. And the idea that there is a single form of Hinduism is a very silly idea that never really came to India until a bunch of Protestants called the British took over for a couple of hundred years and said, so what is your Bible? What is it that everybody in India believes? Uh, right. And some guy in Calcutta said, oh, we have the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, the British said, aha, so that's the Bible. And the Hindus, a lot of them believed it too. So there are a lot of Hindus who think there's only one kind of Hinduism. It's in the Bhagavad Gita. That's all there is. But not only scholars of India, but other forms of people in India, people all over India have many, many different holy books that yeah. tell many different sorts of stories. Well, and a lot of them, them all together? together. What brings them all together? Like what makes it like a category? Do you know what I mean? Just 
Uh, a lot of people think it's not a category. A right, people, exactly. I guess that's right. The word Hindu is meaningless. Yeah. Um, I'm not one of them. I understand that point of view. But if you have people in India who are Buddhists, and if you have people in India who are Jains, which are yeah. uh, religions that begin in India, and you have people in India who are Muslims, a religion that does not begin in India, but that has millions and millions of adherents. And indeed, you have people in India that, who are Christians. The people who aren't those things are, I think, the Hindus. Right, right. That's good. So I it's love it. Sort of a, it's, a, it's a kind of a default position in many ways. But there are also a lot of things that all these Hindus do have in common. It's not the Bhagavad Gita, but it's another set of ideas, such as the idea of karma. Right, right. All Hindus share that, where some Muslims and some Taoists and some Zen Buddhists would not share it. It's the idea that everything you do piles up a record into your body and your soul, and when you die, you take it with you into rebirth. Hindus believe that. By and large, all Hindus believe in that. Yeah. So there is a core of beliefs. It's not a, there's not a holy book that they share, but their ideas that they have they all know about the, the Kali Yuga. These right. people that I want to right, call right. Hindus and have been called Hindus. It's an awkward word because it was given originally by the Persians. It really means the people who live in the land of the oh, Indus, Indus River. River yes. And so it's not their own. Well, there's a lot of problems with calling them Hindus, but there's, there's been no other word offered that works. So when you were a child, um, was it clear that this is the path that you were go on to study this? Or how did you, how did you become the, the person that uh -oh. we recognize as you today? Oh, I loved it. Well, the first I heard, my mother gave me, I wrote a book about my mother and her role in my uh -oh. life last year. My mother um, was very interested in other countries. My mother never finished high school, but she was a highly educated woman. And she knew about India. She knew about Angkor Wat. Um, she knew about a lot of things. And she gave me a copy of Umar Garden's books about India. And she gave me a copy ah. of A Passage to India. Oh, and eventually right. I read the Upanishads and what I now realize was a terrible translation, but nevertheless, it's what we had then. So right in high school, I was always interested in religion and I was always interested in ancient languages so I knew Greek, I learned, learned a little bit of Greek in high school, and I loved the idea of Sanskrit, that it had funny letters that were different from the letters. Yes, of the yes. alphabet. So through high school, I already knew that I wanted to study ancient India. When I was 17 and I went to Radcliffe, I studied Sanskrit. So yeah. I, I knew what I wanted as, as a teenager. I was fascinated. And I loved, I loved everything about India. I loved the the bright colors. I love the food. I love that you could eat with your hands. I've always uh, loved that. I never liked knives and forks. To this day, I'm really not good with knives and forks. So I love the earthiness. I love the bright colors on their paintings. I love their music, that the music didn't go bump, 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 but it went yes. and it split up and down. It seemed messy and rather than the formalness of, of Christianity and Western stuff. It, it seemed that you could slide back and forth. I love the stories. Yeah, I love yeah. the sculpture, all the hands on the gods and um, it, everything. It was not simple. It was not, oh, well, you had just a picture of Mary and Jesus. Instead in Hinduism, you had all these gods with heads and hands. And, um, I so love that. Multiple. Everything was multiple about it. I loved yeah, it. Yeah, rich. Like, yeah, I love that. You know, I, I had a friend of mine who was a, um, a theosophist and, and came to um, divinity school to study Sanskrit. And yeah. it, it kind of defeated him. He, he just wasn't able <laughs> to master it. You know what I mean? I think it was just a huge disappointment for him. At theosophy, the time, but, theosophy is not really Hindu at all. It's I know, I know. It's so, but I, you know, he had his heart in it. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me a little bit about the language. Like, um, you know, it's a highly inflected language. You know, what makes it such a difficult language? And, you know, what are some not of the a difficult language when you learn it? You know, I always wonder how little tiny Chinese children can learn Chinese. Good point. Like, They're like great really at it too. <laughs> they just think it's that. So um, it's like any other language. It's a little harder to learn in the beginning. Um, it has uh, 56 letters and it has many more cases. Every, every noun has single, plural, and dual. And instead of five cases, it has eight cases. And uh, you have to learn a lot. You have to memorize a lot of stuff in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, but after that, it's, it's, it's just a language. It's just a wonderful language. Um, it has compounds. Um, 
it's it's really easy. So easy sense, the kind of Sanskrit that I, I'm not a very good Sanskritist actually. There are many different kinds of Sanskrit, and the kind that I read is like Koine Greek. Oh yeah, right. Greek. Um, you know, my Greek teacher at Harvard used to say that if Paul had taken his Greek class, he would have flunked him. <laughs> the, the I'm glad Testament. Paul's hard to read. I, I agree with you. <laughs> New Testament Greek is so much easier than you know Plato or something like that. So the kind of Sanskrit I read, which is storytelling Sanskrit, has has its own vocabulary and its own forms. And after a while, you read it like English. Yeah, yeah. What, what were some of the teachers who influenced you? Is, is, and, and what did the field look like when you first started? It must have been just a really different landscape, the kinds of scholarly questions that people were asking. Like, what was it like in that world? Mm. Well, the teachers that influenced me, of course, if you ask any good scholar, they'll always tell you about their high school teachers. Oh, that's, that's good. good. Really good. Yeah. Miss Lilienthal, Anita Lilienthal, she was young, she was straight out of teacher's college. She must've been 23 or 24. Uh, she was my Latin teacher. And she knew I loved Latin and she knew I loved India. And she said, well, I bet you'd really love Sanskrit. And I said, what's Sanskrit? So wow. That's, that's where that began. Lovely. But then my teacher at Harvard was the great Daniel Ingalls, who was oh, a yeah. great uh, historian of uh, Sanskrit and Sanskrit literature. And, um, he didn't like women. He didn't really like Jews. He didn't really like black people. Yeah. And um, he ran, his family ran the Homestead Hotel in Virginia, which wow. was anti-Semitic. And so he came from a very bad background from the yeah, standpoint of liberal. But um, although I was a girl and Jewish, he kept saying, you know, it's a waste of time educating women because they just get married and have children. Um, he nevertheless did educate me, yeah. and um, I graduated summa cum laude because he recommended me for a summa, so wow. he, he, yeah. he did nourish me in every way, and um, so he was an enormous influence on me, and, and the things that I learned from him stayed with me forever, so, so I had good teachers all, all along the way, but I was the only woman in the field for a long time. Oh, I can imagine that. Uh, How was that? I mean, what was that like? Um, in many ways, it was fun, <laughs> I must say. Um, I liked being a woman and I liked working with men. And um, I, except at Berkeley, where I was treated very badly for three years, except for that brief period, um, I was, um, there, when, I, when I taught in London, there were some um, male scholars who, when I entered the senior common room, would put down their paper and walk out. Ah, that's terrible. But but then there were people who didn't. They hired me, you know. Yeah. So there I was. Um, so I really felt that I got along with most of the men in the departments in which I was the only woman. I was the only woman in this and that and that. Yeah. But I was with mostly. I was mostly with men who thought it was rather nice to have a woman in the department. And so I didn't suffer the way a lot of women suffered um, in my time when I came to. Chicago in um, 1978, there was, I was on the Committee on Social Thought and I was in the Department of South Asian Languages and I was in the Divinity School, I had a triple appointment yeah. and I was the only woman in each one of them. Wow. And so Chicago announced that they'd appointed three women, <laughs> one in South Asia, one in. <laughs> oh, that's called killing three birds with one stone, Absolutely. I guess. I, I don't I, know I, what I, they call it. Yeah. Um, but, um, I was mostly treated well in all those places. Um, it you know, was, I, it was I, I, I love that. I mean, so much of the book too. I, I, I do think that being a woman, you know, really made the book a lot richer. Do you know what I mean? I just, I just think there's a way in which your like eyes are open to things that, you know, that maybe my eyes wouldn't be open to. Well, one and, thing was I could talk to women. Right, exactly. Completely. So you get all these books by these male anthropologists yes. and they tell you what everyone feels about everything and you realize they've never interviewed a single woman because in India, a woman would not be allowed to talk to them. Right, exactly. So how did, how, how did that just change your field? I mean, because you were the, the one who was speaking and you did, you did have this unique perspective and you were able mm -hmm. to talk to, to women. You know, how did that change you know, how, how the world looked to people studying South Asian languages? Well, first of all, other women joined. I, I didn't stay the only woman for long. I stayed the only woman in the South Asia department for like 25 years. They were very slow to appoint other women. Yeah. I was not the only woman in the divinity school. Mm. They appointed other women soon after. And I had, I had women colleagues. But 
um, I also was able to get away with a lot because I was not only a woman, I was a rather flamboyant woman. <laughs> so I wasn't a woman in a three-piece suit. Right. I, I didn't play that game. Um, yeah. I didn't try to sneak in and pretend I was a boy. So everybody knew I was a girl. Um, and that allowed me to ask uh, questions and talk about human things in ways that sometimes the men felt that it was um, beneath their dignity to do. So you could talk about sex. Sex, yeah. There's a you lot of sex in your book. About, there's a lot of sex in the world, you exactly, know? Exactly, <laughs> completely. <laughs> um, so you could talk about that. Um, also, women students came to me, and indeed also men students would come to me with personal problems that they felt they couldn't bring to the male professors. Yeah, I can imagine. So I had really, especially in the early years when I was only five or six years older than some of my students. A lot of my students retired before I did. I, <laughs> I, would, I would be able to find out things about them and help them in ways which were a little more personal than the ways that my male colleagues had. And that enriched my life. And I had some wonderful, brilliant students that I could really participate in the lives of in ways that I think a lot of my male colleagues felt it was beneath their dignity to do. So doors were open to me as a woman. There were, I didn't notice doors shut to me. I know there were doors shut, but, but a lot of doors were also open. Yeah. And that was a great privilege. You know, um, one of the things about Grace Cathedral that you may not know, but we have a, we had like six or 700 people practicing yoga every Tuesday night, well, before the COVID-19 started. Um, and and it, it's an interesting scene, you know, um, a, cler a clergy person from the cathedral staff will like give a short little talk and then pe people practice yoga in this massive Gothic cathedral. <laughs> And I, and I remember reading and studying a little bit more about the kind of the scholarly approach to yoga. Um, and I wonder if you can, if you have anything to say just about yoga in America and, you know, in what ways does it understand you know, uh, Hinduism and what ways is it, is it not understand it? And, you know, what are the family resemblances? Well, that's a, a complicated question. Um, yoga in India begins in the centuries um, before the common era and it's a meditation system. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about concentration. It's about, the word yoga is connected with our word yoke. yoke like you right. yoke two oxen right. together. And also junction is also related to the same word. It means joining things together and it means the way you'd harness up oxen, the way you'd harness something, you harness up your mental forces in yoga and you concentrate in certain ways. It has nothing to do with the training of the body. Yeah, yeah. Patanjali's Yoga Sutras have only one thing to say about the body, and it is sit in a comfortable way. Ah. That's it. All right. So the idea that yoga is a way of training the body in order to train the mind comes largely from Swedes in the late 19th century. Yeah, like the German health movement. German like, health movements. Yeah. And then it was picked up eventually by Iyengar in India. So right. it gets some Indian input um, in the late 19th, early. Well, it does why, finally have some Indian input. It's one of those things. I mean, it, it, you know, California is part of that story, like turn of the century health consciousness, uh, turn of the last century. So, you know, right. 1905 health consciousness in California is part of that story. It's almost like, Californians kind of getting something of their own back to themselves again. <laughs> it's really true. It comes back Reading like, books like a, a pizza effect. It comes back to California. There's more <laughs> California than India in, in American yoga to this day. Yeah. Um, so it, sometimes I get very snobbish about people quoting Sanskrit mantras when they're doing downward dog or something like that. So on the one hand, it has really nothing to do with India. Um, my other great teacher in Chicago is Mircea Eliade. Oh yeah, of course. Great book, yeah. which he published in 1958. The, year, the English translation was published in 1958, the year I went to Radcliffe, ah. was Yoga, Immortality and Freedom. Right, right. One of the best books ever written about India. And it's about the meditation tradition. It's not about downward dog. Yeah, yeah. So you on know, the one hand, um, yoga has nothing to do with India. On the other hand, it's, it's a wonderful system of relaxation and people's bodies. It, but, you know, Ayanga was a very interesting man. So it's a, it's a modern Indian tradition borrowed from the Swedes. And then there's a coating of Indian meditation on the top of it, like icing on a cake in a way. So it's a very funny bastardized tradition 
but it's done a lot of people a lot of good. So yeah. it's a good exactly. thing. Exactly, and it's and it's just it's you know in a way all religions are I mean are, are like that, right? They they get some. Yeah, I mean that was something I I think so I've been thinking about so much. I've been dying to ask you about just you know what is in the Jewish and the Christian traditions. That, that, I mean, obviously people have written papers about the influence of South Asia on those traditions. Is, is there anything to say of it or is it just so far back that we just, we can't really talk about um, that, that line of connection? Interesting, good question. Um, Hinduism began much earlier than Christianity and Judaism, yeah, exactly. the 1500. On the other hand, um, the Christians have been around for a while and the Jews for a while longer. And there's been, contact between India and the rest of the world right from the start. There's stuff, uh, there's evidence of a knowledge of the Hebrew Bible in the Indus Valley civilization 2000 BCE. So India is not isolated. People managed to get across those Himalayas. They had boats that sailed to South, South India for in centuries and centuries before the common era. So there is contact between India we, we have in the Hebrew Bible, the idea of peacocks and Solomon and so forth, they knew about India. So the world was already all joined together in the ancient times. And there are ideas, in particular, the last avatar of Krishna is Kalki who comes riding on a white horse. And um, he comes to, it's the Kali Yuga, it's, it's, it's this terrible age we're in now. Yeah. And one of the characteristics of the Kali Yuga is that India is overcome by barbarians. So what it really is, is this horror of immigrants, which we now experience in such a shameful way. Yeah. That's, that's the Kali Yuk too. They've run, overrun, these foreigners are overrunning us. That's, a, that's an, uh, a sentiment that's expressed in ancient India as a characteristic of the Kali age because foreigners came into India all the time. It was, they, they pillar, you know, the wonderful things came from India, ivory and gold and all this sort of thing. So, the, the rider on the white horse comes into India to free India from the barbarians. But the white rider on the white horse is a Christian apocalyptic image. Yes, exactly. And it comes into India from Christianity. <sighs> so Christianity gives India the image that they use to express their desire to get the Christians out of India. <laughs> oh, that's so great. I love to that hear that. That is how mythology works. You take exactly. what you find and you use it in any way you want. Well, exactly. And that's why, you know, we're so offended when Donald Trump walks across La uh, the, the Lafayette Park and stands in front of St. John's and, you know, everybody's trying to use these religious symbols in, in their own way. And, um, and yep. they're very that's powerful. How that game is played. That's how that game is played. Yeah, it is definitely how that game is played. Um, have you ever heard of Eknath Ishwaran? A, 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 he was a, a English professor who lived in California and did translations of the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. I mean, that, uh, it, there are uh, other examples of just of how uh, it, we see Indian culture in America. And I wonder if you have anything to say about those two. I mean, uh, Diana Eck is doing that pluralism project that's showing how many immigrants we have who are, who are, who are um, Hindus. Um, but I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about both those kinds of um, phenomena. Well, I think the real, um, India came into um, America really in the end of the 19th century, began yeah. with the Chicago World's Fair, really, the right. World Parliament of Religions, Religions yeah. and Vivekananda, and then Annie Besant, and so forth. Yeah. So um, a certain brand, I, I, we, you've been asking very good questions. So you got me to talking about how broad Hinduism is and how there's no single thing. Well, one tiny little part of Hinduism got into America in 1897, whenever the World's Fair was in Chicago. And that is a particular brand of Upanishadic philosophy redone in India, in, the, in Calcutta in the late 19th century to make it as much like Unitarianism as possible. Ah, uh, interesting. It's usually, it's, it's a brand of, of modern Hinduism. It's called Reform Hinduism some, sometimes, or Bengal Reform. And it is influenced by the presence of the British and in particular by Unitarianism. And it picks out from Hinduism certain things which are acceptable to a Western audience. It was designed to do so. So we don't have anybody slitting the throats of goats, which is a perfectly natural way to be a Hindu. We don't, <laughs> we don't do that. In America. We don't do that. We don't do that. We meditate. 
and we talk about the union of the soul with the world soul, which is also part of Hinduism. So there's a selection of a particularly mild and philosophical brand of Hinduism. Uh, You've got before that, you have the New England transcend transcendentalists right. who love the Upanishads they and so did, forth. So there's there's a kind of India, of, of a little piece of Hinduism that has always been very attractive to Europeans. Germans all loved it too. Um, Nietzsche and so forth. So, so you have that kind of Hinduism gets into America. Yeah, it's just, I, I guess, the way that missionary ha work happens everywhere that, you know, like Yale Divinity School was uh, larger than life in, in, in bringing Christianity to Hawaii. And so a lot of like ways Hawaiians look at religion and Christianity in particular was um, more influenced by that kind of Christianity than, than other forms. Exactly. Yeah. So that was that piece of Hinduism which got into America in various forms, starting with Annie Besant and so forth and going on with Aknot and so forth. Um, you had some of the gurus coming in the, in the 50s and 60s into California. Right, right. That was also really part of that same kind of Hinduism, the meditation, the unity of the soul with the, with the soul of God, the individual soul. Most of that really is in the Upanishads, which are a wonderful philosophical text written in about 600 BCE and still um, a big part of a lot of Hinduism. That's of, of, of the thousands of books in, that were composed in Sanskrit. That's one of the ones that had the greatest staying power. And it's a beautiful book too. It's a wonderful book. So that piece of Hinduism is really what got into America that and the Krishna Bhakti part, the, the Hare Krishna people in the airports right, and all of right, that. Exactly. That's another piece of Hinduism that got in, which yeah. is different from the Upanishads, which is the love of God who loves you. It's a very easy and simple and attractive part of Hinduism. And the mythology of the child Krishna is very sweet. It's like the worship yeah. of the Christ child. It has a natural appeal. So those pieces of Hinduism have been very successful in America. Yeah, it's so that's so interesting because you're right. We recognize all those as being part of our uh, our world. Um, yeah, um, one of the things that you, you write about is just like just vegetarianism and what that means in Hinduism. And, and I wonder, you know, how do you how do you describe just kind of the, the the kind of history of that idea through 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 South Asian religion? Well, that's also a point a point of argument, I must say. Um, the idea that no Hindus have ever eaten meat and that no Hindus do eat meat is, is simply not true. Um, yeah. Some Hindus don't eat meat. Um, but it, as, just as I'm saying this, all different kinds of Hindus, the sacrifice of goats, the sacrifice of chickens, as we speak, somewhere in India, someone is killing a goat and or a chicken. So animal sacrifice and the eating of meat has remained a very important part of a great deal of Hinduism. A lot yeah. of Hindus do that. They, they, they sacrifice animals and they eat meat. Some Hindus do not. That really is not, that didn't begin as much with Hinduism. It began in the sixth century or so BC, the so-called axial age, when Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism were all taking a new form in India at that time. And Jains really do not ever kill animals. Right. And they do not eat meat. Uh, real serious giants wear a mask so that they won't accidentally the inhale an ant. And yeah. they have a brush that they brush the path as they walk on, lest they accidentally step on an insect. Yeah. Those are serious vegetarians. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of Buddhists are also vegetarians, although some are not. There's a, something in India called Buddhist eggs, which is that the Buddhists are allowed in some parts of Buddhism to eat an egg that hasn't been fertilized, but they can't eat an egg that might have a live chick in it. Uh, so when butchers see a Buddhist coming, they reach under the, I can't do this on the screen, they reach under the counter and they break the shell of the egg so that the Buddhist can buy it. Uh, so even in Buddhism, there's a little bit of um, a finang, but yeah. some Hindus at the same time um, as, um, um, as the rise of Buddhism, Jainism about that sixth century BC, some Hindus became, um, serious about not taking the life of animals and also not taking the lives of humans, which is something that most Hindus have never believed in. There's always been a lot of killing in ancient India and right straight through. But there were some Hindus who didn't 
who believe that you shouldn't kill anybody, including your friends and relatives, um, and including Muslims and other people, yeah. and including animals. And that is the part of that 19th century branch of Unitarianized Hinduism right. that has been spread as Hinduism and that the present government of India Modi's government is saying is all that Hindus have always believed that all Hindus believe and they're using it of course to kill the Muslims who still provide the meat that many Hindus eat. All right. I'm glad that you brought that up because I mean that's one of the things too I mean even in the book you mentioned having someone throwing an egg at you just um, <laughs> and maybe you could talk a little bit about just like you um, know like you're kind of your your controversial side like what makes you a controversial person you know, um, why do people have problems with you and your work? Yep. Um, well, I'm controversial because I've written a great deal about the other forms of Hinduism, other than that Unitarian Hinduism, which Vivekananda brought to America. Yeah. So people who want to believe that that is all there is to Hinduism are angry with me when I say, look here, look at these other texts and look what there is and look what other Hindus believe. So the idea that Hinduism is a unitary religion, just like Unitarianism, and that all Hindus are very much like um, a certain type of Christian, that they're vegetarian and so forth. So I have been fighting against that idea all my life. I've been saying, look at these stories, look at these stories, and look how good they are. Right. I, it's not like, you know, the, the early Christian missionaries, oh, you're all barbarians, you, you sacrifice goats, why don't you become Christians and stop doing it? Um, I'm not doing that. I'm saying this religion is so much more interesting than anything Vivekananda ever said. Yeah. Look how wonderful Hinduism is. And look, when you look at the ancient texts, look how much there is about women, about the defense of women. Uh, it's not just, you know, widows burning themselves on their uh, dead husband's funeral pyres, which yeah. is the notorious form of Hinduism that the British made fun of. But there are texts saying women are smarter than men, women shouldn't be pushed around, w widows have a right to remarry and so forth. Look how they object in ancient texts to the treatment of the lower castes. Look how liberal so many. So here I am saying how wonderful Hinduism is, how much more interesting it is and how much more humanly liberal it is and they say, oh, you hate Hindus, you hate Hinduism, and so forth. So you know, it's funny, I mean, just in, in just the American context, I mean, the people who get most angry are, are, are the people who say Christianity is this one way. And, and I agree, it's just, I think, I think a large part of our, our work as human beings is to remind people that just of the diversity of, of, of the experience and expressions of, of Christians, of Hindus. And, and so I, I do, I, I can imagine how angry people get, you know, just based on how angry people get at me for, for you know, saying and that. Then again, you're, and then again, you're not a woman. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, and I'm also, uh, you know, I'm in the community speaking about the community and there's that element too, where you can, you know, someone can say, well, you're an outsider and so you don't know anything. Or, so I'm you know, a woman, I'm not a Hindu. Um, and I talk about things, I, I, I call it like it is. I talk in a very uh, vernacular way. My books are easy to read. People do read them. They're successful. There's just a whole lot of things that um, make those who want to preserve the image of Hinduism as a tiny, straightforward, very respectable, rather colorless religion. Um, they don't like um, all the nonsense. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. for years when it was still friendly, I would give a long lecture in a, in a big lecture hall and then there'd be Q&A. And invariably, in those days, people were still very polite, the good old yeah. days, an, an elderly Indian gentleman would get up and instead of asking a question, he would give an alternative lecture <laughs> so that the people in the auditorium would know from an Indian man what it really was like. Yeah, oh, I can imagine that. And I would give my right arm to have that man in the audience now rather than the people that I have to deal with now. Yeah, he exactly. was always polite. He had his own point of view. He was a wee bit sexist, but it was respectful. Um, and then you have the whole question of cultural appropriation. Oh, yes, totally. Which, um, you know, I retired two years ago. I'm going to be 80 in November. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah. And um, I thought I got out just in time. Yeah. Just, I was lucky to have the long run that I had because the idea that 
only a person who's raised within a religion has a right to talk about it. I but not only put me out of a job, but it is it would destroy the humanities. The whole point of the humanities is to get into somebody else's head. And the idea that only women can talk about women and only Jews can talk about Judaism, which is wow. something also I've been fighting in academically um, all, all my career and that and that only people from inside a religion, that only black people can talk for black people. Um, that idea is so destructive of the real humanity of the study of religion and the study of comparative religion, which is my particular field, yeah. that I don't know where the field will go now, how we will ever learn to get along with one another when, when women won't let men into classes on feminism and, uh, and so forth. Yeah. It's, it's not just Hinduism, it's part of the whole bracketing off of the world, uh, which we're fighting so hard against. I was, among all the terrible things that have happened this week, there were some good things and it was wonderful to see white people and black people together in these demonstrations. It's right. not just us right. against them. Yeah. Um, and I wish that there was more of that in the academic study of religion too. Yeah, you know, um, Dermot McCulloch wrote like a, another a book like yours size on the history of Christianity. And I really appreciated having a non-Christian perspective on Christian history. I, you know, um, he, you can be a bad historian and non-Christian and you can be a, a good historian and, and non-Christian. And he, I think he has. No, no, I'm not trying to replace Hindus. I mean, this yeah, exactly. conversation, you have Hindus who know things I could not possibly yeah. know. And I've always said so. And I've always used their work and quoted their work. Ultimately, you want the insider's view, but it's there are things that the insider does not know about her own religion. Exactly, exactly. And you want those as well. You don't want them instead. You want them as well. Yeah. Diana Eck always said, if you know only one religion, you don't really understand religion. That's right. And that she really? was a good teacher. I have a, um, so one of our traditions on our, our show is that we um, take questions from the audience. And so our first question is, um, if you could recommend a Bollywood film, what would you recommend? Do you, do you know anything about that genre? Do you have any film recommendations? Yes, there's a wonderful film called Amar Akbar Anthony. Amar Akbar Anthony. Those are the names of a, he, a Hindu, Muslim and Christian boy who grow up together as children in India and all the things that happen to them. Um, it's a wonderful, it's, well, it's a delightful movie. One of my students wrote a whole book about it. It's a famous and, and rightly famous movie. And it's a wonderful movie about these three religions and how different they are and what 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 a friendship between them is like. It's it's a great movie. That's the one I would recommend. Oh, that's perfect. I'm so glad. I've, I've, and now we can get things like that and we're and we're watching Absolutely. a lot of things like Absolutely. It's a famous one. You also get the book about them too. It's also nice, but read them, see the movie. What do you think is the most important thing for a non-scholar to know about Hinduism? To know that it's, you'll never understand all of it because it's so enormous. Yeah, well, that's what I, amazed me. You, you, you talked about like the number of verses in the, Veda, in the Vedas and compared to like uh, how big the Bible is, for instance, and you're right, it's just, it's, it's impossible to get your, your arms around it. It's just, no, it's- you, you can never know about it. And it, because it has vegetarians and people who kill, uh, who sacrifice goats. It's, you have to realize you're never, it's not one thing. You have to learn about 150 different basic things that it is. It's a, it's a philosophy, it's a religion. It has funny stories, it has sad stories. It has bigots, it has liberals. So that there is no, there's no one single thing about Hinduism. You have to acknowledge that whatever you know, it'll only be a little tiny piece of what it, you could know if you could live a thousand years. So another question is, are you following the political situation in India right now? And could you comment? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's very much like the political situation in America right now, where the man in charge is not the man you would want to have in charge. Yeah. Where, the, where there's a terrible need for somebody with wisdom to deal with the crisis and what you have is someone with a very narrow view. Narendra Modi has a very, very narrow view of what India is and what Hinduism is and he enforces it. Yeah. Um, 
in a very powerful way. It's not a, uh, an accident that he and uh, Mr. Trump are friends. They're joined, among other things, by their shared hatred of Muslims, but they're also joined by a lack of understanding of what I can only call diversity. Yeah. Um, and therefore things in India are going very badly because first of all, things in the planet earth are going very badly. And uh, there's a lot of poverty and there's a lot of suffering as there is in America. So there's no, it's a matter of scale there. Um, so they too have a problem with health. They have a problem with uh, inequality. They have a problem um, with religious violence between um, not so much black and white, but in their case, between Hindus and Muslims. And the man in charge is doing nothing to prevent any of those bad things happening. On the contrary, he is fanning the flames. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that sounds like a very familiar picture. You know what we have? We have some photographs and images that um, we, we, we got. And we'd love to, I'd love to have Rebecca put them up. And maybe you can talk a little bit about them. We don't have very much more time, but I wanted to have something to like give us a sense of that like manifoldness, the multiplicity that you were yes. describing. Yes. So Rebecca, if you put up the images, that would be great, and then we can we can um, we can see what what which, what. Oh what we yes. Have. I can see that. That's right. Okay. So that's an image from the book I just sent to the publisher now about the history of horses in India. And it's about how Indians love horses, even though their horses always come from outside, in particular brought by the Muslims, and how the presence of the Muslims in India changed the whole culture of horses. For the ancient Indians only liked stallions, but the Muslims rode mares. And so in the Middle Ages, you get in India stories about wonderful mares that you never had. There's all macho stuff in the ancient Vedic texts. Stallion, <laughs> stallion, stallion. And all of a sudden, these mares come. So this is an image of a man on a horse trampling another man under his feet. Right. So it begins with the idea that horses are foreign, that they're dangerous, that they're big, that only rich people have them, and they're destroying us. And so that's the, the negative image you really ought to have of horses. And yet Indians, Hindus have loved horses, even when they never saw a real horse. They told stories about horses. They drew pictures of horses all over India. You see lovely images of horses. So the book is about how Indians came to love this foreign animal and to love the culture that brought it in. It's in a way, it's a, it's a tale of the assimilation of a foreign religion in a very positive way, even though you begin with images like this and you have throughout Indian history statements that a man wants to die where he can't hear the hoofsteps of Muslim horses and so forth. Uh, very yeah. anti-Muslim statements yeah, like yeah. The, this one. And yet you overcome it with these beautiful pictures of horses and stories of horses weeping because they love the owner so much. And so uh, much. I love the, the hearing that you're, you worked on this, um, on the project about the horses and your mother's book. What, 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 do you, what projects do you have coming up next? Um, what, what, are you, what are you thinking about in terms of your scholarship and study? Well, the horse book has to get through the press. So we're, you know, going to argue with the copy editors and all that sort of thing won't come out for another for another year but the work I, what I'm working on now is the translation of the last books of the great epic of the Mahabharata which is all about dying and going to heaven and hell so it's really um, a story about eschatology about different ideas people throughout the book wonder what happens to people when they die and some people say, well, you go to heaven. Some people say, no, you go to hell. Some people say you're reborn. So in the context of a story, it's the end of the great epic. After, after the war is over, there are these books at the end of the Mahabharata, all about the different possibilities of what might happen to you when you die. And uh, it's never been really translated well before. And I, that's my project now. I'm doing it for Oxford University Press. Oh, great. I'm so glad. I, um, here's another image. That, oh, this, um, is, like this is a horse sacrifice. Here's so much oh of vegetarianism. Nice. So they're taking apart the horse and they're washing the different parts of the horse. And so they're doing these are Brahmins preparing uh, the, the, the stallion. This is a stallion. This is early India. This is a Vedic sacrifice. And these are all Brahmins chopping up the horse in various ways. Wow. Yeah. And this is a Buddhist image of a horse headed demoness who is considered very beautiful and very sexy, even though she has a horse head. 
And she carries off, she's like a siren. She carries off Buddhist sailors to a fate worse than death. And so that's the Buddhist text. Uh, the Buddhists have two kinds of horses. They have the horse that the Buddha rode when he became enlightened, a horse carried him away and then wept for him. And then there is the female horses. So the, the good stallion and the evil mare, the female horses that carry away sailors, seduce them and then ultimately eat them. <laughs> These are the beautiful horses in South India. This is a photograph. My book has lots of pictures in it. I have an art historian, Anna Seastrand, who got these. Oh, she great. took this. They're often 50 feet high. They're wow. made of, of clay. They're fired in a pit for three months and so forth. And they're, they're stationed around temples in South India. And then in the night, the gods ride them all around the villages to protect them. So this is the worship. This is Hindus worshiping horses. The same Hindus that experienced horses in history in a very negative way, being trampled on by foreigners. And yet the villagers who never had horses, who can't afford horses, they love them because they're beautiful and wonderful. And they make these fabulous images of them and put them all around their villages. Oh, I think that's like the perfect image. When you first started and talked about what you love about that world, this image just seems for me to just be the, 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 the um, perfect example of that. You so know, I've, I've, I've had a chance to, um, to hear you um, speak at um, Harvard Divinity School and at American Academy of Religion. And uh, I was looking forward to this so much, to seeing you and, and, and to, to hearing what you had to say about your work. Um, but our time has, has run out. Um, it just seems like the blink of an eye, but um, now we're, we're, oh, these are the other horse images too. Yeah, these uh, are but, the uh, it, it's been such a pleasure to have you. Um, and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. It was very thoughtful and, you know, it was, it was really helpful, I think, for, for us to, you know, get a picture of a, of a different world for right now. So thank you it so was, much. It was a great pleasure. It's always nice to be asked about your work. And I enjoyed, you asked, you asked good questions too. I, you gave me a chance to say things I wanted to say. So I'm grateful oh, to you. I'm glad. Well, I've enjoyed your book so much. It's just been such a pleasure to, 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 to read it. Um, Thank so you. For all of our visitors, um, next week, um, our guest will be Herman Weichen, um, professor from San Francisco Theological Seminary and the Graduate Theological Union, whose focus is exploring the gospels for their revolutionary insight. Um, you can help us to bring the arts to life at Grace with a gift of the forum. Please join us at gracecathedral.org dash give to Grace. And again, thank you so much, Wendy, for your generosity of spirit and for your lifetime of work on these really important questions. We're, we're so grateful to you. It was all pleasure, I can assure you. <laughs> thank you and take care.